Hello, it's Dr. Deepak Bhatt here for ACC.org reporting from Barcelona about the European Society of Cardiology 2022 meeting. It has been a fantastic meeting and we're here with day three wrap up. And I'm here with two good friends, Gabriel Steg and Paul Coley, and we're gonna get started with the Invictus trial. Paul, do you wanna tell the audience what that was about? I like that trial. Absolutely, I actually like the name too. It sounds like a superhero or, you know, something like that. So the Invictus trial was a randomized uh, open label trial for Rivaroxaban versus vitamin K antagonist in rheumatic atrial fibrillation. Rheumatic AFib has been such a black box for us as clinicians. We really don't know what to do when it comes to how to treat it. So this was kind of the practice changing study looking at a DOAC and seeing how how it compares to vitamin K antagonist, which has been the standard of care. It was um, 4,500 patients randomized and followed for 3.1 years. And surprisingly, at least to me, it was a little bit surprising. There was clear signal for benefit for the vitamin K antagonist over Xeralto, which was the DOAC used in this trial. There was no difference in bleeding outcomes. And there was actually a lower signal for death as well with the vitamin K antagonist. So, you know, rheumatic heart disease, which has been such a, a, a black box for so long, we finally have an answer that if you have rheumatic heart disease, AFib, and increased risk of stroke, as evidenced by your CHADS to VASP, or smoke in the atria or a small mitral valve area, you need to stay on that warfarin with that INR between two and three. Yeah, no, great summary. I was surprised too. I haven't been using it in those sorts of patients, of course, but I was sort of assuming the trial would be positive, which is why we should do trials and never assume things. It was a real win for warfarin and an expected win. Uh, Gabriel, um, what about the whole factor 11A story? There were uh, some phase two trials presented of two different compounds. Can you give us a synopsis of what it all meant? Yes, yeah, so factor 11 antagonists uh, have been designed with the idea that we may have safer anticoagulants that might be as effective as conventional anticoagulants, but lead to less bleeding because they might avoid thrombosis, but preserve the hemostasis uh, mechanisms. Um, and there's data to support this, both in genetic studies, in preclinical models, and some evidence in clinical studies with other compounds that target the factor 11 pathway in orthopedic surgery, for instance. So there are now two oral agents that are being tested in phase two, uh, in both in, after stroke or uh, after ACS. And those ranging studies were presented today. I won't go into the details. I think the bottom line is fairly simple. Across these studies, there seems to be no clear uh, dose-related increase in bleeding with these agents, suggesting that indeed uh, there might be a somewhat safer profile than uh, the direct oral anticoagulants that we have for now, the factor 10 antagonists. Uh, with respect to efficacy, the results are a little haphazard, and it's hard to make uh, a sense of the results, but we know that in phase two studies, the uncertainty is enormous. And in fact, we have historical evidence from prior trials that compound that uh, compounds that had major benefits in phase three had not demonstrated evidence of efficacy in phase two. So I don't think we should do anything else than uh, ask for phase three studies to be conducted. And then we'll, yeah. have, we'll know whether the promise of a safer but effective anticoagulant uh, can be uh, really borne out. Yeah, really great stuff. So uh, I'll, uh, perhaps you can fill in the audience on Momentum 3. The five-year results were presented here. I thought it was really important data. What did you think? Yes, very important data, Deepak. So this was really the five-year outcomes looking at the fully magnetic levitated flow pump versus an axial flow pump and looking at clinical outcomes to see which type of device is actually better for patients. And what the results showed at five years was that there's better overall survival with the levitated pump as opposed to the axial flow pump. So the HeartMate LVAD3, uh, the centrifugal pump, was better with respect to lower bleeding, lower stroke, lower pump thrombosis, and lower need for reoperation requiring, you know, a replacement of the pump or repair of the pump due to malfunction. And we even saw this in patients who were destination therapy patients, the ones that were not eligible for transplant. So really definitive outcome data over a long term that tells us that this should be the device we should be using in all of our advanced heart failure patients. Yeah, really great to see five-year follow-up for these sorts of device trials. I think that's really important to the field. Okay, well, the final one to cover here is the post-PCI trial. I thought that one too was quite important. 
Yes, I, I loved it. It's a, it's a pet topic of mine on how to best follow up patients who have stable coronary disease. And these uh, South Korean investigators randomized in a pragmatic trial, 1,700 patients who had, un who had undergone successful PCI to either standard care or a strategy of routine functional testing at a year. And long story short, there's no difference in outcomes between the two treatment arms. So there's no need to subject patients to routine functional testing because not only does it not improve outcomes, but it led to more invasive interventions, more costs, more discomfort to patients that was totally unnecessary. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, your bottom line thoughts on that one? I, I was going to say this is another strike for the interventional cardiologists on, on, on this seminar, but, but I would say it's changed my practice or it will change my practice because I know that for a lot of my post PCI patients after a few years, especially if they complain of some funny symptoms, I had been doing some routine stress testing to take a look and see. And now all I know is that it just increases cats and, and PCIs and it's not improving their outcomes. And I have that data that I can share with them. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Though well, the guidelines have been generally clear that that you know practice of this routine stress testing post PCI wasn't indicated, but but it's great to have some actual data because the practice in some quarters has been pretty prevalent. Well, uh, wonderful insights from both of you as always to the audience. Hopefully this was useful. Please join us for the final day, day four. <laughs>